So Bunker Labs, hey, happy Friday. Welcome to a town hall as part of our all in. We are all in for you and we're gonna talk about that today with Bunker Labs founder and CEO, Todd Connor. Todd, so happy to have you here today. Awesome to be with you, Liz. Thanks so much for leading the community, supporting the community and helping kind of facilitate all these important conversations um, for small business owners and entrepreneurs right now. Absolutely. So happy to do it. And, you know, we're definitely seeing so much just lean in from our community and from all of you being here um, and, you know, looking to us for, for resources and we're looking to you to see what we can provide. So Todd wanted to jump in today and, you know, discuss kind of the state of things. Um, so, you know, Todd, just over to you first to kind of, how are you handling this situation yourself? What are you seeing, you mm -hmm. know, in general from the big picture? Yeah. Well, um, personally, so, uh, you know, personally, it's, uh, you know, obviously, like everybody, we're just dealing and trying to understand this new reality. So um, we, uh, personal, on a personal note, we adopted a, a son. So he's over there. So I might pull him in at some point. So we've got a newborn at home. Uh, I was on uh, technically on paternity leave, like the second half of February and March, um, where in, in Florida, where uh, Jasper was uh, adopted. And, uh, and then we kind of came back to Chicago and then kind of COVID blew up. And so I kind of got back involved, obviously, with the organization. I was never really uninvolved, but um, kind of jumped back into work um, and uh, to understand, like, what's the, where are we at as an organization? I think for most of us, we're having to think in, in three dimensions. One is like our home, our, our you know, and our personal lives, our, our own selves, which is I think super critical. And then uh, the organizations in which we work. So for me, it's like thinking about you know, new son, our home, uh, are we safe? My family, you know, I have an aging parent and so forth. Um, and then thinking about bunker. And then the third extension is thinking about the clients that we serve, so the entrepreneurial community. Hold on, it's like <laughs> I'm gonna go grab. We're doing real life here, Liz. We are doing real life. I can't wait for you all to meet Jazz actually in a few minutes. We were just talking about him. Um, and you know, and also just to Todd's point, which is interesting, is just what's going on in our lives outside of COVID-19. Welcome, Jazz, meet the community. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the one of the things that's so interesting is just how we're all having to blur the lines a little bit between our personal lives and our professional lives. And I don't think that's a such a bad thing, honestly, um, but it's a little bit foreign and I don't know, I think there's a lot of grace and forgiveness for that as well. Um, I certainly have it for other folks. So, um, so what did it mean? You know, I, so, uh, so back to the bunker, you know, our mission is to, is to help people start businesses and we do that. We believe in sort of three things, inspire, equip, and connect is sort of our mantra. Inspire is you got to tell stories of people that remind you of yourself that in fact they have started businesses and that it might be possible for you you know if we think that entrepreneurship is only like the mark zuckerbergs of the world then it's going to be very hard for us to access that because we're not you know harvard dropout you know whiz kids at the age of 19 you know um which i admire by the way it's just most of us that are in the military or have served or connected have not you know that's not our life so we believe in telling great stories that that inspire us to think about starting a business. We we believe in equipping people with resources, and then we really believe in connecting, which is events and networking. So we had last year we hosted like twelve thousand people in person at events across the country through Bunker Labs across thirty chapters. So when you put in place social distancing, it really it just destroyed, it blew up our whole model for how we believe in bringing the community together. So. We, I think one of the last events we had in, was in March and it was a Louisville ribbon cutting uh, ceremony and a, and a sort of a, a networking event. It was awesome. I was there for it. Um, but then we really just canceled all the events after that through June. And so for us as an organization, we have really doubled down to say, okay, how do we support uh, small business owners that are going through this unbelievable economic crisis right now? And, and so it's really about equip. So if our tagline is inspire, equip, connect, you know, well, connect is not happening in person. We're doing a lot of it. You're doing a lot of it online. It's happening online, the digital space. Um, inspiring feels a little bit tone deaf right now um, because I don't know that any of us is feeling really inspired, uh, but equipping is something that we really need right now. So to me, it's, we've really tried to posture the organization around understanding the, the, um, the PPP, understanding the stimulus, 
uh, the economic disaster loans? What are the resources available? How do we support each other? How are we going to get through this? What are your strategies? I'll share with you my strategies. So, you know, as an organization, we're trying to really lean into that, um, this reality that we're living in. And, um, you know, I think there's a moment where you're almost like dazed and confused about what's going on here. And then we really realized, and this was, you know, several weeks back, hey, we're, we're an entrepreneurship organization at a, at a point of, you know, unbelievable once in a hundred year economic crisis. We have, you know, this is to me, it's like we're the fire department and, and the building's on fire. I mean, let's go, you know, this is, this is where the action is. So um, everything that we're doing, everything that you're doing, the all in campaign, um, the resource hub, you know, we want to be really relevant and helpful right now. And, um, you know, I just, I, I want folks to share with us what's working, what you need, what's not working. And, and we're going to try to meet the, meet the needs as best we can. Absolutely. And, and I like, you know, kind of your breakdown of, you know, equip, connect, inspire, and all those different pieces, you know, that are happening in this entrepreneurial community. Um, and Todd, if you'll share with us, like, what are some of the stories you're hearing from the community? And how do you think this is kind of amplified in, in a local sense, in a regional sense, and in greater in the national sense, you know, for entrepreneurs about what they should be seeking out and the connectedness that needs to happen for us to, to move forward to be equipped? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm hearing a ton of stories. Some of them are of kind of obvious um, you know, it's, and it's all over the map, I guess is how I would characterize it. I mean, some, you know, folks have been, have lost jobs. Folks have, um, have seen their fundraising rounds just go on pause or be frozen. Some have closed rounds uh, and are accelerating the pace of growth of their business. And so it's, it's kind of all over the map. Um, I think what I, the flavors that I hear specific and maybe unique to the military community, one is a certain, um, there is a certain resilience that I see in um, veteran small business owners, which is, you know, you hear these stories about like distilleries that start making hand sanitizer. I think veterans are first to the fight when it comes to that kind of it, like those kinds of pivots and innovations. Um, we've had a, a number of companies in the network that have pivoted to making, you know, cloth masks and uh, providing healthcare support or doing healthcare, you know, kind of frontline transportation services. Um, so I think there's been a, a real creativity um, and resilience that is uh, demonstrated in the veteran community. And I really, I do think it's unique actually, or that it's at least that the, the levels of that are greater in the military connected community than they are in just the general small business community. Um, so th th there are things like that, that I think are cool and exciting. Um, there is um, the economic reality of, of, uh, of losing jobs and economic insecurity and food insecurity. And so the, those things are true as well. Those are amplified. And then I think there's a, there are pockets of real optimism and even, um, I don't know, and I don't want to sound tone deaf, but I do hear this from folks, some excitement about what does this mean? If work from home is the new normal, what are the opportunities? Um, and I, I think, you know, it's maybe too early to have some of that, you know, to, to fully, you know, if, you, if you're not ready to go there, then I would say don't go there. But some folks are there and they're, and they're thinking about, okay, well, what does this mean for hyper-local economies? You know, if I don't have to come to an office, uh, does, that, does that, you know, disaggregate uh, the need to, to, to live near a city? You know, well, then what does that mean? If I'm just picking where I want to live based on where I want to live. Um, it changes kind of a, a forecast for um, the future of growth in small communities and rural communities. And so there's, there's implications like that as well. Um, uh, I think Bunker Labs, we've always been a virtual uh, organization worked, working in the digital space. And so, you know, I think it's a question for all of us, how we go back to work. Um, obviously, WeWork is a, is a huge partner of ours. and We, we, we have uh, offices at WeWork and um, I think the co-working model will be accelerated. Um, uh, but I think the sort of like, big uh, permanent office model might be disrupted. So, I, you know, again, it's sort of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think there's people that are, are you know, once you can, you know, we have to all focus on our basic economic needs and then beyond that, think about our businesses. And then beyond that, you know, hopefully begin to think about opportunity. And, and um, uh, I think we're all going to hit those, those phases at different points, but um, I'm hearing all that from the community. 
And you're getting a lot of support in, in those from our community just right now, real live, like live time. And I want to share something from Chris saying that, you know, the pivot actually to virtual connection has allowed him to connect as an entrepreneur to so many people that he never would have reached out to or never would have connected that is actually able to help his business and those connections and knowledge base. And so I, I want to talk about that a little bit actually is like, yeah something that we talked about as an organization of what does it mean to be uh, borderless, stateless? What does that mean for the, not only global, but our national connectedness as entrepreneurs? Yeah. And how are you seeing new initiatives from organizations to cross collaborate, to yeah. collaborate more you know, intently during this time? And how will that affect us for the future? Um, totally. I think that that brings some positivity and smiles to this um, yeah. situation that we're in currently. Yeah, totally. You know, it's um, now having a strong network is absolutely critical to starting a business. And and uh, let me just be academic for a second. I think the structural challenge for the for the veteran community, the question of, you know, why is it harder for them to start businesses or is it harder for them? The answer is not a talent gap or an ambition gap. You know, you know, military veterans, spouses are motivated, talented. That's all true. What they lack on, on a structural level is network connections because only 1% of young people join the military. So when you get out of the military, you have a, you know, it's like the army. It's such a small place, actually. You know, if you do a 30-year career in the army, like you, you kind of know everybody. It's actually kind of amazing, even though it's this giant enterprise. Um, so you have great network connections from within the military. But when you leave that environment, particularly if you're coming out of like, you know, leaving Fort Hood and moving to Seattle or moving to, you know, uh, New York or some, you know, whatever, wherever you go, um, you know, to me, it's, that's a giant disruption and you show up um, skilled, but lacking a network. And so I think uh, if you want to, you know, if you ask, how do you move the needle on helping people start businesses? I, my first go-to answer is really about the network effect. People that come from entrepreneurial families, start businesses because they have those role models because they kind of know how the deal gets done. There's all this social capital that comes with having done it and seen it that it's almost like a language. You're like, Oh, well, I know how this stuff gets done. Uh, but if you don't come from that environment or aren't connected to that environment, then you're left wondering like, well, how does this get done? And, and frankly, it, then your mo your model is like, well, I guess it's like shark tank on TV. And the reality mm -hmm. is it's not like shark tank on TV. It's way more accessible. I'm passionate about this because I've, I feel like I've lived in like both worlds a little bit. And I'm like, no, it, it, trust me, you can start a business. Um, but we got to break it down like Barney style for how to do it and make it really simple. And so, um, but anyway, I, I don't want to digress, but a big part of how you are successful is by having a good network. So what constitutes a good network? Um, I think there's two flavors of this that are hugely relevant and this will speak to why the digital environment is so there's so much opportunity i think you number one need um uh to, be, to have a good network number one you got to have um people locally that are uh value to you so locally it, you know it's like because certain things are local in nature um a real estate broker needs to be local in nature um, knowing how to hire employees, that's fundamentally a local exercise. Um, knowing how to raise money from a local bank or borrow money from a local bank, it's a local exercise. So you have to have, you know, marketing. You could get that virtually, you know, but you might want it locally. So it, it sort of depends. The Chamber of Commerce, local. So you have to, in, in, in most instances, have a local network that is going to be relevant for you. But then you also um, need things where, the the physical location of your network is totally irrelevant if i'm opening up a food truck in austin texas i need a local network to help me understand hey how does permitting work how does um what what are the best times where do you park your truck to sort of create optimal lunch traffic okay th th those things are local in nature but i might learn something by talking to a food truck uh, owner operator in seattle who's like six months ahead of me who's like hey by the way they're doing this like fast casual chicken concept out here that if they're not doing it in Austin, you should do it because it's a total hit in Seattle and it might be popular in Austin. So, you know, knowing someone who's six months ahead of you in the business, exact kind of business that you're trying to start is a hugely relevant network connection for mentorship. And that does not matter. They don't have to be local. 
And so I think about the digital environment is if we can create those kinds of network connections, um, which are really specific, um, that's of huge value for, for me wherever I am. So, um, so I think we're accelerating in the digital environment, those kinds of network connections. At some point, you know, we're still going to need local, uh, you know, physically local, you know, local geo local contacts as well. But um, I think if we as a community can unlock both, then we give the veteran community a huge advantage around starting a business that non-veterans would look at with envy to be like, wow, I would love to have a piece of that network. Um, and that's, you know, I think Bunker Labs, I mean, our mission is to kind of figure that out and put those pieces together. Absolutely. And I, I love that point. Um, you know, and, and I know unbeknownst to you, right, but uh, Chris has actually had a food truck, went to brick and mortar, who was saying about this connectedness and how important this is right now. Um, so even not knowing that, just those connections and, you know, across the industry also, like people saying, this is a great time to find a mentor. You know, all a lot of our guests have said that. Um, so, you know, this time though is, is not without frustration, right? And, and the connectedness is wonderful, but there are certain frustrations that our business owners are facing. Um, you know, as we all know uh, with PPP, um, you know, being out of money as of yesterday and, and a lot of people talking about that in our, in our group, you know, but where do you see those opportunities for creativity to start thinking about, you know, longevity for business um, and financial planning and what maybe certain partners and organizations are looking for, you know, in grant writing, like Renee Bob shared, um, you know, along with the frustrations, what are the, the opportunities for creativity to, to maybe pivot or, or, you know, figure out some other things for your business? Yeah. Well, um, I, you know, I think, you know, and veterans, I think, have an attitude around this, but it's like, don't let the crisis go to waste. So um, it is a crisis. And, and for most small business owners, it's a crisis. Um, we're going to get out of it at some point. Um, and there will be a future beyond this at some point. Now, we don't know when. So that's the variable. Um, so I don't want to say, like, you know, it's like there, there's a silver lining for every story because I think that that's not necessarily true. Um, but I think because it is a hard moment, but I, but I also know we, all, we will be on the other side of it at some point. So, so to me, the smart thinking is, what does it look like to um, flatten the business curve, right? So we talk about, you know, the, the COVID curve, but, uh, you know, how do you flatten the cash flow curve of your business and kind of buy yourself time? And whether that's, uh, you know, creative strategies to uh, find you know new sources of revenue or, or or decrease spending i mean everyone needs to be doing that we need to all be in a little bit of a conservative i mean a very conservative posture at this point um you know those are all important things to do uh i think the question becomes how do you emerge out of this and be quick to do something on the other side of it so i think speed is going to be a huge at speed is an asset throughout and if you're a small company um there's a lot of structural disadvantages, but you have one structural advantage, which is speed to change. And so um, my encouragement to entrepreneurs right now is be really quick to take action that puts you in a conservative cash position today, uh, defensively uh, uh, positions your, your company for an unknown amount of time, sort of survive and, and flatten your business curve. Um, and then really be thinking about what does it look like to go to market when we are on the other side of this? Um, and then be aggressive in doing that. You know, it's, um, uh, I think uh, there are unprecedented opportunities to create employee loyalty in this moment. Um, there's going to be unprecedented opportunities to pick up new talented staff on the other side of this with, with folks that are going to be unemployed. There's going to be unprecedented opportunities to broker creative arrangements with, um, with institutions. I'll just, I'll give a couple personal anecdotes to help make this real. Um, you know, we have a, we own a, a bed and breakfast uh, in Indiana and it's, it's like a wedding venue. Um, and so we have it as a bed and breakfast, it's called Emerson House and it's a, it's a side business. And my, you know, my husband spends more time running it than, than I do. We don't, I don't spend a lot of time running it, but whatever, we have a team in place. And so the, but the big business model is really weddings in the summer. Well, that's all, you know, for the most part been canceled. Um, but what we did was we got in front of it and we told uh, brides and grooms that had booked, we said, number one, we're coming out with a free date change or cancellation policy. So you can book and then if you ever want to change a date, you can. Um, well, a bunch of places 
uh, a bunch of uh, brides and grooms that were looking but nervous booked with us because every other venue had cancellation fees. It's like, well, so, so we could like win new business because we're like, well, let's just be flexible. Um, and then we did other things and we're actually exploring other things like, you know, they canceled the local prom in um, Chesterton, Indiana. And I was like, well, it's, you know, it's a big, it's a property on 30 acres. I'm like, what if we hosted an outdoor prom? There's unprecedented PR opportunities um, that if you can take the long view, if you think it's, if you think about that business, a wedding venue, just in the context of the summer, well, it's going to be a rough summer. But if you if you creatively think about, well, there's unprecedented opportunities for PR. I mean, we're talking. Uh, we were just talking this morning about do we charitably donate it for uh, frontline healthcare workers to sort of go there for, for, to quarantine, you know, for 14 day periods if they have exposure risk. Um, which, frankly, is like I just want to be part of the solution in this moment. So, I think organizations that lean into the community, serve and support the community are going to find loyalty on the other side of that. Um, and, uh, and people that are creative in terms of um, uh, saying, well, how do I at least just lend the attributes of my business to be doing something in a bigger way are going to find PR opportunities. They're going to find loyalty from the community. They can find future customer commitments that emerge out of that. So I, I think it's just a time, it's a season, you know, I think it's a season to be in a state of creativity is absolutely um, kind of critical right now, in my view. And I think we're seeing that right in the in the, some of the companies that you mentioned and that we've been uh, highlighting to in our all in, uh, you know, interviews. I encourage all of you to to check out what other entrepreneurs are doing, um, you know. And and one of the things, you know, that is that is maybe a frustration and looking and, and thanks for those personal anecdotes. I'll, I'll drop a um, link to Emerson House if any of you are interested in looking at that too. <laughs> not um, to say, but yes. No, not for the weddings, but just for the the business he is talking about. Um, yeah. Todd, man of of many businesses and many talents. <laughs> Um, you know, but talking about those soft pivots and what we've called is, you know, keep, stop, start, um, which I think is, is kind of interesting when you're applying it to like your personal anecdotes too, of, you know, for you, when you're talking to businesses, you're talking to strategic partners as well, which is a really important part of this, um, as we move forward, strategic partnerships that we've talked about, you know, for you, keep, stop, start, what does that mean for businesses? And, and how can we also look at this as an opportunity, like you're saying, to be flexible, to feel like we can discover, you know, different pathways to revenue, different pathways to loyalty for yep. new and existing clients? Yes. I think pathways to, to loyalty is, is huge right now. Um, Another personal anecdote, I was talking to um, uh, my alma mater, University of Chicago, and I was talking about teaching a, a leadership class in the fall. And, you know, because of the crisis and, and, and higher ed's going to get hit, you know, everyone's, everyone's going to, you know, uh, uh, get hit in some way, right? Um, and so they're like, you know, we actually don't know if we're going to have the budget for this. And I was like, I, I, don't, I don't need to get paid. I mean, this is sort of like, like you know, my, my, my thesis is like, I don't need to get paid. I just want to come teach a class. And if I do a good job, like keep me around if I want to keep teaching. And those kinds of expressions of loyalty are, will get you in the door in a moment where, you know, if you're just saying, uh, I'm not going to engage um, without getting paid uh, or you're stuck in yesterday's business model, then people will sort of, you know, you know it's going to be easy to, for people to say no to you. If you lean into, um, uh, and I normally, this isn't the normal speech, but like giving some stuff away for free, really showing up and being loyal for people, um, you have an opportunity to get in with new clients, new customers, build loyalty, build understanding, such that when the fog does lift, like you're, you're, already, you're already with them. You know, they already know you. And so um, taking advantage of, of that kind of opportunity when, uh, you know, in the B2B sales space, uh, everyone's gonna be looking for cost reduction opportunities. So if you've been trying to break into an industry, like it's never been easier than it is right now. They will be forced to be open to creative sales pitches because they're gonna look at some potentially existing uh, kind of retained services as, uh, as being cost liabilities. So your ability to show up and say, I'm willing to do some things for a really reduced rate or for free, um, because I want to prove myself. I want to demonstrate my capability. And then by the way, when the fog lifts, I want you to keep me around and, and I do want to resume to market rates. Those kinds of conversations I think are available and, and people can have them. Um, 
I, I, I think that from a, a philosophy about how do you lead and be an entrepreneur in this moment, I think there's kind of three camps that I've been dividing the world up into. One is my business is on pause. Um, I need to just uh, freeze the business, apply for the PPP, get the money, and then we'll kind of wait for uh, the recession to sort of pass, and then we'll resume business as normal. I, I think that's that's um, flawed thinking. That's that's you know I think that's I don't think that's sufficiently strategic. But that's camp one, and I think a lot of uh, industries are going to act like that and just ask for big bailouts and sort of pretend that like life will just resume as normal at some point. And for some, it will. The second camp is let's take what we were doing and try to um, do it virtually. You know. Um, but fundamentally, not really rethink the business model, but let's just try to do it virtually. I think that's good. I think that's actually, that's not wrong. Um, it's better than like hoping that we just get through this at some point and then everything goes back to normal. I think that's a better strategy. But then the third camp, and I think this is where I would encourage all of us as entrepreneurs to think, and I think this is actually naturally where entrepreneurs go, is like, let's build a new mousetrap. Like, what's it going to look like on the other side of this? And and I don't want to just pause what I was doing. And I don't just want to do what I was doing virtually, but I actually want to rethink what I'm doing to, um, to, to leapfrog into maybe a new creative model that um, is, is actually meeting future state needs uh, when, when this whole thing has passed. And again, again, this whole thing will pass at some point. So, um, so I think, you know, how you think about that is, um, it's a, is a strategic opportunity. It's not a one size fits all for any given business owner, but, um, uh, but that's kind of where my head's at as well. You know, there are, if you think about Bunker Labs, there's 40,000 veteran nonprofits that exist. 80% of them have a budget of less than, you know, $100,000. So you're going to see a, a, a massive recalibration in the veteran non, nonprofit space where a lot of veteran nonprofits probably are not going to be around in, um, you know, in 12 months. And so what does that mean for Bunker Labs? Well, you know, we're a nonprofit, so we're worried about funding with our major partners. But I also think for our major partners, you know, to support an economic recovery for small business, they're going to need partners to help do that. So I'm, in my mind, for Bunker Labs, I'm like, how do we aggressively make sure that this organization is highly relevant to the small business recovery? And if we are, then then I'm, I'm not worried about funders coming alongside us and saying, we're going to help you do the work of small business recovery, because that's what's going to be relevant. So, um, uh, I think that as long as you have that posture of, of thinking about um, creative ways to, to survive the moment, including your own personal finances, flattening the curve on your personal finances, finding creative ways to get through it, um, and then beginning to think about like, uh, what's the new world order and how do we you know, build a business to meet it? I think that's, um, I think you're going to, your future is going to be bright. And I like that too, that, you know, those answers to keep, stop, start, maybe three months, six months from now will be very different. Um, from what they are now, potentially, because you're going to keep doing things in your business that you discovered, created, mm -hmm. like you're saying, in this time yep. um, of crisis. And and actually, it goes along with with our first question. I want to get to the couple questions that we have from um, from our community. Um, so Mandy says, you know, technical wise. Um, can working from the digital space be seen as a new possibility for your business offerings in the future? How can it change your services and the abilities to serve your clients? And how can you communicate that now for new and existing clients in the way that you're saying of being uh, transparent, you know, and, and, and realist, mm -hmm. but also, you know, looking for the future? Totally. I mean, I mean, I think the answer is yes, you can. And, and, and what it looks like for each business is going to be a little bit different, but, um, but you know, I mean, it's this unprecedented time of like, you know, I wouldn't have a baby on a conference call, <laughs> you know, on a Zoom call or a Facebook Live, you know, six months ago, I would never even, you know, we probably wouldn't. We're be glad you do though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, but like, there's this opportunity for real personalization, um, which is actually kind of interesting. And, you know, that like, I think face-to-face uh, -face communication will be sort of the new norm. I don't think we're going to go back to conference calls that are just dial in. I think we're going to expect a video exchange as opposed to just a phone exchange. And so um, I think that creates opportunities. I think um, what I've always believed is that uh, companies that are in the business of solving their customers' needs um, are going to win the business, you know? And so through content creation, which you can do digitally, through highlighting the stories of your customers, which you can do digitally, uh, by creating a community of support, 
for your for your customers, putting them into a community of support for each other. Um, there's unparalleled opportunities because there's unparalleled uncertainty for you to do sort of uh, informational kind of, you, if you want to call it selling, um, uh, for your for your clients and for your customers. And so, you know, I think there's a, there's a, the aperture of possibility is just way more open than it ever has been before. The opportunity to build, in some ways, more personal relationships uh, is is more open than it is before. Um, and again, you, if you're a business serving the needs of your customers, your customers' needs have not changed. I mean, the, the, well, that's not true. The, the, the way in which those needs are going to be met has changed, and some of their needs have, have changed. But the, the bottom line is, like, you know, if, you are, if you're an organization that has customers, what do they need now? And, and then just go be relevant to what they need now. You know? So for Bunker Labs, it's like, well, you know, massive networking events isn't sort of what feels relevant right now, but man, learning how to apply for the stimulus package sure is. That's $2 trillion, you know, or it's, I guess, $349 billion for small business. And so we just jumped into that. We're like, it's, it's, it's all about the stimulus right now. Now the money's out. So now we have, okay, like, so now what do we need to know? But as long as you are staying really curious and close to your customers about what it is that they need, I think you're going to be relevant, you know? And I think don't get too tied up in a business model beyond just serving their needs. It's like serve their needs. And then like, I think a business model will begin to emerge. I'll give a, an anecdote locally in Chicago. We've got this like amazing juice bar and uh, uh, you know, it's just local organic. It's like ridiculously expensive. You know, it's all that. Right. But it's like, you know, $14 smoothies, right? It's stupid. Um, and you know, with shelter in place, they basically couldn't, couldn't do that. But they also have like, um, like these like lunch bowls to go that are like local organic, you know, meats and fennel and all that good stuff. Um, and it's healthy. Well, they figured out like they're not doing that business anymore, but they have this whole supply chain of local farms and local, you know, dairy. And so they just organized meal boxes to go. So they basically just reconstructed their supply chain to say, Hey, do you want to be on a subscription meal um, uh, meal kit delivery? You know, you Sunday night, you tell us what smoothies you want on what days, and then what food you want, and we'll just directly order it from our um, our suppliers, and we'll deliver a kit to you. And it's, and I'm like, yep, yeah, signed up for it. Totally awesome. Because like, I'm worried about getting food. I'm worried about you know, I don't want to go into stores. And like, they just popped up with a new solution, like our local juice bar. And so. You know, the reality is they're, sur they're surrounded by other uh, markets, but the markets weren't first to do that. The juice bar was. And so we signed up with the juice bar and it's a good service. And so we're sticking with it. So I think, you know, again, opportunities like that are, are popping up and it's going to be about speed of ideas and speed of, of execution, I think, to, to win the day on that. That's great. Um, I have not discovered something like that around me, but I would love to, um, to have the smoothies of the overpriced juice bars, of course, <laughs> that we all still go to. Um, you know, and, and interesting enough, you know, we have had a lot of discussions around the food industry and one of our entrepreneurs, Derek, who is, uh, you know, he has animals, clean meat, um, grass grazes his company. He has clean meat production that doesn't stop the animals growing and needing to be, um, you know, brought to market doesn't at a certain time doesn't change. So now switching to those delivery options, switching, you know, coming up with those solutions, um, which I think is, you know, it's, it's just like innovation, you know, it, it is what entrepreneurship is, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, and you know, one of, one of the questions, um, Todd is something that you did mention, which is back to the, you know, stimulus package, is that a lot of small businesses are, um, especially the little guys, are feeling um, skipped over and left out from PPP um, and the e EIDL. Um, and so what are their options and what would be your suggestions, you know, for them to get together to discuss um, options or collaborations, but also, you know, for funding and to have their voice heard um, mm -hmm. over the larger organizations that have already gotten that relief? Yeah. No, it's a huge, it's a huge frustration. I mean, it, it's a boom industry right now for lobbyists um, because uh, lobbyists are being, yeah, it's, it's a boom industry because people, companies are paying lobbyists to go lobby for uh, inclusion in uh, these various relief packages that are coming out of uh, Capitol Hill and, and state legislatures as well. Um, and so that's a challenge, right? And so I, I, you know, we're really trying to lean into, you know, 
you know, advocacy as well and say, you know, you, you, you can't solve this crisis. Um, you don't solve the economic crisis if you don't solve it for small businesses. And small businesses are the ones that are small business owners and it's the people that, are, that we support and talk to. It's who we are. It's who we are as people, small business owners. We're the ones saying, well, do I even, do I even keep this in business for the next three or four months? It might just be financially better for me just to declare bankruptcy and walk away and just recoup the, recoup the assets. And so we don't, we, as a country, we can't afford for that to happen. So, um, so I agree. It's frustrating that the PPP ran out and that, you know, it's like some of us are feeling left behind from that package. Um, I think the answer for, uh, for your teams and for your customers is keep them close. Um, there, I think part of what's going to emerge out of this, and this is the optimist in me is that we're going to have a, a desire for local companies um, uh, to to buy from, you know. I mean, it's sort of like shop local is like a concept; it's a thing. But I think that there's going to be a real sort of relocalization of a lot of our living, a lot of our buying, um, a lot of our what will feel right for us. And so, um, you know, small business owners are our neighbors, and so I think it will be impossible for our, I don't think our buying preferences just revert back to whatever they were six months ago. I think it just looks different. And I, I'm not, not to be myopic about it because um, uh, people are always going to shop on price and things like that. But, um, but I think that there will be a recognition that small businesses have, have been hurt and that they need to be included in what happens next. And that there'll be a desire, to, a, 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 a consumer desire to support that in ways that I think we haven't seen entirely before. Um, I think the other thing is with your teams, don't, don't um, neglect how much uh, being part of a company means to someone emotionally. And it's not just about the paycheck. It is about the paycheck, but it's not just about the paycheck. Um, companies and employers, and this is so true with small business, I mean, it's like a family, you know? So if you've got five, 10 employees, I think meeting their spiritual and social and emotional needs that might sound too lofty, but I think being there for them in this moment is arguably as important as the paycheck itself. Um, and so, um, and, and I'm going to get it wrong, but I think Gallup does a global attitudinal survey. And it's amazing how like levels of belonging, people trust more the information that they're getting from their employer than they do from the White House, than they do from the government in some, in some instances. So the position that you hold of trust and of safety as an employer for your employees is hugely important. And I think even if you're transparent and saying, look, here's where it's at, we're out of money, we've got to furlough you, but, but I'm, not, I'm not ignoring you. Let's talk once a week, let's stay in touch, let's support each other. I mean, people, people just need that mental lifeline as much as they need the financial one. And so I think if you can create that for your employees and create that continuity of team, uh, they need it. You're going to need it. And then hopefully, you know, on the other side of it, you've got something that you're working with to kind of put the company back together and go to market. Um, but I wouldn't, don't, don't forget that, that role that you play emotionally uh, for the employees that, that you, um, that you have. I think that's a great point and, and the sense of community and how important that is to people on, on a very small level, even if you're a company of three, um, all the way to a company, you know, of thousands. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely. And Todd, so as we kind of come up um, on our time, um, I just want to, you know, send it over to you for the for the last word for businesses. You've given us so much, um, a, a good dose of inspiration, actually, which I think is is definitely needed here. But equipping us, you know, to prepare for that other side, right, of recovery. Mm -hmm. um, but last word to you, just for our bunker community, you know, what should we be focused on and doing for each other? Yeah. Well, I mean, number one is like stay connected to the community and definitely support each other. We're here to support you. Like, so if you're a veteran, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a military spouse, if you're active duty, the guard, the reserve, um, you know, we're here to support you and, and um, reach out, you know, don't do this alone. Like we're in this together. Um, and, and, you know, you know, put us on your team as a support system. Um, that's number one. Number two is stay optimistic. Uh, you know, there's, we're going to be through this, you know, study history. Look at the Great Depression. I've actually been watching documentaries to try to understand what are the parallels, historical parallels that we can learn from previous pandemics, from previous recessions. Um, and what you know is that, number one, we do emerge. Number two, there's opportunity. And so I think when you hold that, 
you know, then you can stay optimistic. What you don't know is the time, uh, the time variable, and you don't know what's the cost and the pain that sort of is required for us to get on your side. But, but there is another side, and so uh, stay optimistic about it. And, and again, I think your ability to be fast and closer to your customers um, is those are the assets you can grab hold of right now. And uh, and I think people, companies that do that, that get closer to their customers right now, as opposed to say, hey, our relationship is on pause, but let's talk in the fall once we're past COVID. You know, those are the companies that may not be relevant you know, come fall. So stay close to your customers, uh, find ways to serve them. And, you know, I think a business model will reemerge in their side of it. Um, and, uh, you know, take care, take care of each other. Um, but uh, I'm here for you. If you ever want to drop me a line, shoot me your ideas, and, and I'll, I'll do what I can for you. And, uh, um, you know, I think the military community, it's my final thought, is, um, is uniquely resilient. Someone shared, let me see if I can put this on my backdrop. It's a meme of, uh, well, okay, it's not going to, so this is a, a, a Navy ship behind me. You don't see the text, but somewhere below it is something like, Boring same meal every single day. Can't tell the difference between days and nights and weekends. Um, you know, stuck in the same place with the same, like, you know, ridiculous people. And then it's like, dot, dot, dot. Sounds like you were never in the, in the military, you know? And so I'm like, yeah, quarantine, like, great. Sounds like West, like, so, sounds like my 2003 deployment to the Persian Gulf. So um, it's not that we are flipping about this. It's not that we don't acknowledge the human toll, but I think the military community can sort of look at this with perspective and say, we, we, yeah, we've been through some stuff. And, uh, and I think, you know, in that we have a role to play to help explain and lead people uh, towards a place of, of mental clarity about like, Hey, here's how you get through something like this. And I think the military community is equipped to do that. So we've got a role to play, even as we try to figure our own stuff out. I think we've got a role to play uh, for the country at large. Absolutely. Um, I will compose myself after that meme. We've, ha we've seen a good dose of, of great military memes, actually. Um, one of which was for military spouses that said, oh, the government ne has never told you what to do. That shows. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, which I think we can get a good laugh out of that, of, of our mental preparation for things that we've been through. Um, Todd, thank you so much uh, for sharing, for being here for our community. Like Todd said, we are here for you. All of us are. Um, we are all in 100%, 120% if that was a thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah. we are all in for you. And we are looking forward actually to next week, um, which Todd has put together a great panel. Uh, we're going to have a virtual panel here um, for the Zoom. It's going to be on Zoom webinar, so it'll be open to the public um, as well. And that'll be on Thursday the 23rd. Um, and we also have a full lineup. So Tuesday, we actually have a town hall uh, with Hugh Campbell, um, who is an Army veteran and a founder of multiple technology companies. And then on Wednesday, we have a town hall that with Brian Hamilton. Um, I encourage you to bring your kids to that one because he's going to do a segment on preparing youth to be entrepreneurs as well um, as part of his initiatives now. So bring your children um, to the 20, Wednesday the 22nd because Brian's gonna talk about youth and entrepreneurship. This is a great opportunity for them to start exploring their interests, which I love that. Um, and then Thursday we have a virtual panel. So Todd, thanks so much. Thank you, Liz. Thanks everybody. Jasper, say thanks. This oh, and you're getting a lot of congratulations and welcome to Jasper. <laughs> We're going to teach them young. Teach your kids young. Entrepreneurship, it's a family sport. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> See you later, Tom. All right, Liz, thanks. Thanks.